Hello, everyone. The voice you're hearing right now is Grandmaster Pascal Charbonneau, again here to introduce Grandmaster Joel Benjamin. It's a pleasure to have you back, Joel, for your second workshop. This, this Today, I don't think I'll spend too much time introducing you because, first of all, everybody already knows you, but uh, <laughs> second, second, they know you from yesterday. So I'm just going to leave this stage to you, and I'll be relaying questions, um, questions during the stream when I see them. Uh, thanks again, and welcome. Okay, thank you, Pascal. Uh, let, let me start off by uh, letting our viewers know that we've got a special promotion going on at Chess24, that if you do not already have the premium membership, and why don't you? If you want to upgrade, um, if you use the code CANDIDATES2020, you can get 40% off on that premium membership. That's a good deal. Premium membership gives you lots of extra stuff, lets you uh, comment on things, lets you download games. So it's, it's, it's worth getting. I'm very happy that now I get premium membership as a, uh, uh, as a on air talent for uh, Chess24. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me in isolation. And uh, today is uh, day two of my uh, stay at home workshop. And I will be continuing my uh, analysis of the exchange sacrifice, rook for bishop or knight. And um, I'm going to move into the realm of the bishop pair. Okay. Of course, when you sacrifice an exchange, very often you get a bishop for it, and that will give you the possibility of having the bishop pair. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, yesterday, one of our viewers asked a question about, you know, who are the great exchange sackers out there? And I answered uh, Veselin Topalov because I already, you know, had material prepared with Topalov because I'm uh, very impressed by the by the way that uh, he he would often sacrifice exchange early in the game, like right out of the out of the opening. And uh, in this game against uh, Vichy Vichy Anand, I think it's from two thousand and five. Um, the, <laughs> the the whole exchange sacrifice is actually opening theory, so that's kind of uh, mind blowing when you see how far this stuff extends, and that you can actually you know, get right out into the, um, into, uh, you know, right through the opening, uh, in theory with, uh, with already, uh, an exchange sacrifice. All right. So let's start a topo off playing white. Now, anybody remember the Queens Indian defense? Uh, I mean, I love the Queens Indian defense. Uh, it's, it's not so popular anymore. Now it seems that pretty much everybody plays d5 on move three if they get this position. And it's really because the, the top grandmasters are just looking at, you know, what is giving the best results? You know, what is, what is the most reliable? And, you know, it's these, all these queen's gambit positions tend to be working out the best. So that's, uh, they're all doing the same thing, just like they're all, you know, playing the Berlin or threatening the Berlin endgame because that seems to work. But, you know, back in the 2000s, uh, this, this uh, Queen's Indian with B3, okay, in the, in the more recent decade, people started playing Queen C2 with that, that sacrifice, and that maybe has sort of uh, knocked the Queen's Indian down a bit. But uh, this, this stuff was very heavy-duty theory back, back in the day. Paul was really kind of a big theoretician on the white side. He he played this in different ways. This is not just one of them. But it gets very sharp. We just get started. This is all theory. Still all theory. So Black uh, ignores for the moment his attack on the knight. And he does counterattack on the rook on f1, but also if the pawn takes the knight, Bishop on c3 hangs. So the usual move is to get the rook out of takes. And b2, okay, this prevents white from opening the a file, and the rook will be ready to come right down. And so it's, it continues to get very sharp, knight c4. And basically everybody plays it the same way. I, I don't know if uh, 
there were other ways to do it, but it's a temporary sacrifice if the queen g4, white picks it back up, and now knight d3. So uh, here, white doesn't, uh, well, white really has to give up the exchange, okay? But, you know, by design. Bishop a3. This position has occurred many times, and it could be that the best move is bishop e5. Um, for what it's worth, the, the engine likes it. When you get back to 2005, I don't know if uh, engines were were yet that reliable that everybody was using them seriously in opening prep yet. Um, but uh, that is arguably the best move. Um, it seems like uh, probably not the greatest opening variation for black to go into. All right, so here we have, well, let's give one more move, rookie eight. And um, now, normally, and I spoke about this yesterday, when you give up the exchange, when you're playing with the pieces, you want to keep a pair of rooks. So black is really quite happy to make this trade. But the problem for white is that there are no files uh, really available for the, for the white rook. Uh, can't go to the D file, can't even go to the C file. So uh, Topal acquiesces to the trade but then, you know, posts up this bishop in a threatening position. Oh, right. so let's take stock here for a moment. Okay, white has a great pass pawn uh, for the exchange, and it's defended by the bishop. So that, that pawn is not getting taken. So black is going to have this pawn hanging over his head for a long time. What's really interesting is that if you, uh, if black could, you know, magically force the trade of dark squared bishops. If he can get those bishops off the board, he just win. he just win the position. The, the pawn would be easily blockaded. The queen and the rook would start coming out if he, you know, was able to uh, affect a, a queen trade. Then his king comes to the middle. I mean, he has a queen side majority on top of things. So your first thought looking at this, like, how could this possibly be something for white to play? But the, 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 the fact that white has the bishop pair, that just makes all the difference, okay? Because uh, black is going to suffer a little bit on the light squares because he doesn't have a light square bishop. But he can't just sit on the dark squares either because light, white has one of those. White can pressure on both, uh, both color complexes. So... It's it's a it's a very dynamic position. Uh, engine calls it you know some somewhere in the neighborhood of, of uh, equal with the, that changing depending on you know good moves and bad moves. Uh, but you know it, it's actually not that easy a position for black to play. It's you know somewhat practical from white's point of view, and it's just the kind of thing that Topalov likes. Is he really he really likes the bishops? So uh, this she plays h5. Uh, I mean, I mean, I don't know if that's a good move or not. I mean, uh, at some point he's going to have to make Luft. Uh, I guess he you knows does not not going to want to push the G pawn. So I guess the H pawn has to go somewhere. And of course, he's happy if he can uh, affect a trade uh, of bishops. Okay, so the pawn on H five prevents a check on uh, G five. And, and Black is so anxious to trade these bishops that he's even willing to have his um, his pawn structure destroyed um, to do it. But then he will be safe on the dark squares and his, <clears throat> his queen is ready to come up to e5 to defend. So Topalov just moves the bishop away. And it seems like, okay, Black is very safe, everything blockaded. But the thing is that White can be patient in this position. Because black doesn't really cannot really easily uh, improve his position, and now white is getting ideas that he might target that h5 pawn. Uh, because the queen, where it is right now, g6 is not possible. Because white can take it because of the pin. So basically, black is you know doing some some waiting around. All right. I mean, he doesn't want to play g6, I guess, because that you know weakens his position. In this case, g6, g6 would run into queen f6, I believe, attacking the bishop and also attacking the pawn on g6. All 
okay, so I, what did he not want? He didn't, didn't want um, queen e5, perhaps. And black, black doesn't have much to do. There is a threat of the bishop coming to f4. Queen moves, bishop takes d6, bishop f7, check. This is the power of the bishops, you know, wide open board. This is, uh, you know, if you want an encyclopedia entry of power of bishop pair, you know, this is it. This is, there's nothing blocking them. And so white ends up getting this pawn. And, you know, black is, is not able to trade anything. But this is what he does. The sack back, right? And I talked uh, yesterday about the sack back, uh, which very often happens. And sometimes it could uh, be very favorable and refute an exchange sacrifice. Sometimes it can be des desperate. Uh, in this case, it removes that, that real great pass pawn. And you might think, oh, well, OK, the pass pawn is gone, so I take take but okay now black can be pretty happy in this position because well he's he doesn't have that pass pawn he's okay on the light squares he's got a nice majority on the queen side so well you'd have to say that black has an advantage Polov doesn't take the rook he takes his pawn in a seven well Okay, that, that's a bit of a game changer because now black doesn't have that majority. First of all, now white is genuinely threatening to take the rook. But, um, but because black doesn't have that A pawn, well, it's really hard for black to, to, to make anything happen on the queen side. That A2 pawn is securely defended by the bishop. So white can go back to kind of hanging around and waiting to, to stir something up. And that actually sort of happens. Now, I, I would have to say the position is, is, is most likely equal. Um, you know, maybe white has some ideas of getting a kingside attack going, maybe push the h-pawn at some moment. g6, well, maybe white would push h5 if he didn't do that, but certainly he's got to be careful about his kingside. course no bishop trade again if white trades bishops he's probably close to lost and this is a position that both players can play for a win but around here black starts to get into trouble um, that was maybe a questionable move uh, okay it's not necessarily that that huge a threat to take the rook because the bishop's opposite colors position probably can't be won but uh, queen a6, that's, uh, that's an awkward move because actually it's really just a blunder. It's really just a blunder because it walks into bishop f7. Yeah, so black had to, black had to play um, queen c7. I think queen 7 would have been okay. But after bishop f7, now white gives a few checks and picks up this rook. By the way, note, notice how white floated in that extra check. That was very important because now to queen a2, queen g6. So now we get this position where white has these, these three uh, connected pass pawns, uh, but black has a very far advanced b pawn, which is white is not really going to get under control. So white has to, you know, white has to do, uh, get everything, everything done, uh, you know, uh, on the king side before that pawn gets too far, but it, it, it is a winning position for White, and Topalov did not uh, did not manage to win the position in the end. He he slipped into a draw, then Vichy messed up, and it was winning again, and then it was a draw. So, uh, but it was you know went on like another forty moves or so, uh, and it's really well beyond the scope of the exchange sacrifice uh, at this point. So, I'm going to move on to the next game. But there's an example of Topalov, I, I think is a great exchange sacker. Uh, and uh, like I said, you know, right, right, out, of, right out of the opening. Um, but um, that game, like, like a lot of the games I'm showing, it, it illustrates that you 
don't necessarily need something to happen right away to make that exchange sacrifice work. You can just have your compensation and your compensation can last a long time. You know, you have that pass pawn on C6 and you have the bishop pair and neither one of them is going, going away in the short term. All right, so next game is a classic. Okay, Bobby Fischer against Ben Larson. This was from their candidates match. I think this was game five. So Bobby had already given him a pretty good whooping. And I think that affected to, to some extent what happened in this game. So let's, let's have a look. It's a Sicilian. And Fisher was a big uh, uh, devotee of the Sozin, of, of the, uh, that uh, approach against the uh, Sicilian to put the bishop on C4. Larson, I would say he wasn't really a natural Sicilian player. You know, he, he, he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't that, and I think he wasn't really that sharp a player. And um, I think he was maybe even a little uncomfortable here. This queen C8, I believe, is a novelty. And what's it, what's it do? I mean, it's, I think it's got to be designed to, to prevent F5. But as it turns out, it didn't actually prevent F5. He, he went ahead and did it anyway as a pawn sacrifice. Okay, it's a sound sacrifice, but it's it's really nothing special. Rook F3. Okay, so the rook is ready to come over with some mate threat. It's basically an equal position. Queen C6. Okay, so white really... Okay, well, <laughs> I say he doesn't really have a good way to avoid the queen trade. He can... Uh, he, he does get some some ideas uh, uh, in a moment about uh, uh, not moving his queen away from getting taken. But okay, so black. So after rookie one, all right, black already can can just uh, trade queens. He does rook takes and uh, okay d five. So now Bobby has a nice solution. So here rook g three. This is a key move. Okay, if uh, Black takes the rook, I think, you know, a lot of us know that this is not something you can consider, but this is one of those things where, uh, one of those windmills, all right, so you clean out all the pieces that can, uh, that can um, interpose and then you back up and, and that's that, so. All right, so rook g3 g6 and so the rook g3 move is a prelude to this uh, exchange sacrifice bishop takes d5 although it doesn't necessarily look like an exchange sacrifice yet and in fact uh larson he really should have just taken the bishop right why well, would take and then you know something like rook fd8 with some threats to the bishop c3 Black can do almost anything here, but certainly one easy way to play is to take and to push a5. And uh, the white queen side is pretty well restrained. All right, black has some back rank issues, but I, I don't see that black will ever even have any need to get off the back rank because white really can't do anything here. It's just pretty much a dead draw, right? And I, I, I have to figure that, you know, Larson felt that I mean, I got to win a game, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not, to, sorry, I'm not going to, you know, to play this just to make a couple of draws, you know, to, to finish out the match, you know, six, six points would win. So obviously, uh, you know, draw would get, would, would uh, bring Fisher very close to, to, um, to winning. But, um, Larson plays Bishop D6 attacking the rook and that walks into rook takes e6. Now he can't take the rook on e6 because bishop check and black has to interpose the rook. So that's, you know, that defeats the whole purpose. So you got to take the other one, but then rook e7. All right, and the bishop, now the bishop is attacked and has to move away. White takes, takes a pawn. So by taking the b pawn now, now white has, has taken a pawn for the exchange but he has a two pawn majority on the queen side. And 
generally having a two pawn majority against a one pawn majority is, is more meaningful than just having a one pawn majority because it's kind of an overwhelming force, right? So you want to have that kind of overwhelming force to compensate for the, for the exchange. Also bishop pair, and this is a great bishop pair too, bishops in the middle radiating, radiating out in all directions. Plus, you know, there's this eternal pressure on F7. So, like I said, uh, I think it, you know, it was a gamble because of the match situation. Otherwise, why Larson would want to play this position, you know, uh, instead of just making a draw uh, by taking the bishop, I, I can't imagine. Now, the engines say that it's close to equal, but it's difficult for black to play. The first move wasn't great. Um, I think he really has to play a5 here possible continuation is c4 and then you could try uh, not only to activate the rook but maybe maybe drive the the rook off the seventh rank you know something like this and you know black is is really in better fighting condition than than, than he got in, in the game so after rook c8 white Okay, plays c4. Right, black can trade bishops, but then white's going to get the a7 pawn, and then he's going to going to have a whole mass of pawns. So a5, rook a7. Uh, okay, so now now black is in this really passive position. The bishop is stuck on c7. The 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 rook on c8 can't move. Okay, I guess he figures well with my bishop blocking the second rank. My rook on f8 can move. But it's very tenuous. It's a piece is not going to coordinate. So black is just not ha doesn't have a happy position. Okay, I I love what Fisher did. <laughs> There's a couple moves. Um, you know, Bobby Fisher, of course, was a great great player. You know, arguably the best ever. Uh, but for a very short period of time, because he didn't he didn't play after he won the world championship anything for 20 years, and then played Spask again, and then didn't play after that. So, you know, if you, you know, you, you know Fisher historically, but you never really looked at the games uh, that much. He wasn't really an attacking player, although he had some great, great attacking games. You know, he, he won his, his uh, he, he won beautiful games against the Byrne brothers, both of them, um, with attacks. But, you know, when he beat, uh, when he beat uh, Spassky, I mean, there was a, just a lot of great strategy. Uh, he was a brilliant strategist, and his play was just crystal clear. There, there weren't really that many complications generally in his games, just a lot of good logic. And here, he just plays very simply. He doesn't he, he, he's taking his time. Now, G3, you might say, well, why not King F2? This was one year before, of course, Fischer took, <laughs> took that poison pawn on H2 against Spassky in game one and got his bishop trapped. So you say, why not just king f2? Well, he actually doesn't want to even put the king on f2 because he's, he just wants to stay off that diagonal because if, if he gets the king off the, that diagonal, the bishop on d4 is now free to go anywhere. So first he plays g3 to guard the pawn, and then he plays king f1, and the king guards the critical invasion squares on e1 and e2, and the pawn on h2 is guarded, and the bishop on c7 is limited. It's just it's simple and beautiful. You know, uh, Fisher was a, just, a, just a, such a great player. So what often happens in positions like this, when one side just has nothing to do, you know, and is staring at, um, you know, bad things happening potentially, they often end up losing in, in unexpected ways. That kind of happened here. All right, first, black played rook, a, rook e7. So he taxed it. Okay, where are you going to go? So he decides to stay in the e file. And it comes back and hits that a pawn. h5. Well, he's trying to get some counterplay. It does weaken a6, a g6, though. And Fisher attacks it. And so if black, you know, wanted to defend that, um, he, he also faces the possibility of rook c6 with a very obnoxious pin on the bishop. So he decided to play bishop e5. And, you know, Fischer 
doesn't, doesn't take on g6. He doesn't want to mess around allowing black to, to take on c3, get rid of the bishop pair, mess up his pawns. He goes bishop d2, and now we see, like, uh-oh, now the rook is in trouble. It's run out of squares. Yeah, just, just no place to go there. Um, now, of course, black could leave it. He could play something like king g7 here. And white doesn't even have to take the rook. Well, let's say he does. He could play something very simple like this. You know, trying to, again, tie black down to that f-pawn. And the queenside pawns, they're not going to be blockaded. Uh, without, without rooks, you, you have some hopes, at least for a while. But um, the, the, no, no blockade is really going to stand up. The a-pawn is really going to start running pretty fast. So that, that wouldn't really help black. You know, arguably better than what he did. But he, he, sorry, he tried to be a little tactical, right? Rook takes d4. All right, so if black takes the rook on d4, then black, well, then black is very happy with that to play the bishop's colors position. But Fisher took the other rook. All right, so this is the big idea. Bishop takes e5, rook e4, check. And actually, then black is very much in the game. But the problem is king d3 forces rook c5, and now white can take the pawn in a5, and then now everything is pretty much completely forced. Black has to trade. He really much, pretty much has to take on b2. But now white has a killer outside pass pawn. And the outside pass pawn is very strong in the bishop ending. It's going to be very strong at the pawn ending, too. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I may have included this in, in uh, liquidation on the chessboard. I, I can't remember now. Um, but, you know, this just goes to show that using a timely liquidation into a winning pawn ending can really make things easier. Bishop c3 is just a crushing move because if black doesn't trade, his king won't be able to get over to the pawn in time, so the bishop will have to stop it. And the bishop is not really in a position to stop it because white has moves like bishop d4 to chase you know, black off of, uh, black tries to go on this diagonal, white can chase it off with bishop d4. So Larson tried taking. To be honest with you, I think that uh, uh, that a contemporary grandmaster might just resign this position for black. But, um, you know, Larson uh, keeps going, maybe just wants to try a, a trick or, or, or whatever. But it's, it's pretty straightforward. There is just really one thing white has to avoid. Okay, so he basically just pushes the pawn all the way. Because okay. his king is going to come up and, and start eating. And the one last trick is that white would go wrong by taking on h4. Because if he takes on h4, then he's stuck with rook pawns. And when you have rook pawns, it means you're, the opposing king has a lot of time to get back over. Because, it, you know, you have to, your black king just has to get to the f file. Uh, in order to draw. But of course, Fisher doesn't fall for that. He plays instead king e6. And uh, <laughs> finally resigned. Yeah, because well, white is just going to queen the g-pawn. All right, so um, a, ni a nice demonstration of uh, of the power of, uh, of the bishop pair, even playing uh, against a rook. Uh, and how they can really, um, you know, uh, play very well with vast pawns, but also the, the bishops pointing at the king's side just totally tied black up, and uh, it was a very foolish uh, decision by Larson to force Fisher into this exchange sacrifice, and, and he paid for it. All right, now I'm going to move into a different type of sacrifice, the defensive sacrifice, and I think I think the the, uh, the viewer that uh, asked the question yesterday might have also mentioned Petrosian. Petrosian, he was also famous for exchange sacrifice. He was famous for the defensive exchange sacrifice, and we might just see one of those a little bit later. But uh, let me get the next one up. Uh, the next two examples I got from a, a, a really fine book by uh, Michael Marin, the Romanian Grandmaster, and it was called uh, Secrets of Chess Defense. I, I, 
I quite enjoyed that book a lot. Marin is a good writer. And um, uh, this is a really interesting position from one of his games against uh, the strong German Grandmaster Rainer Kanak. By the way, is still active. He played in the 65-plus uh, division at the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Coronavirus World Senior Team Championship that, uh, that, I, that I just got home from. So he's, he's still, uh, still in the ring kicking there, Kanak. Um, so we're going to pick it up from the middle from this position. And, you know, White has generally had a, you know, decent position through this game. But when, when Marin got here, he looked around for a move and he really had a hard time finding it because Black has now set up some pressure on the F file. And, um, well, it looks like Knight takes F3 as a threat. So you think like, well, I'd like to back my king out of there. Uh, a few moves ago, he played king F2 a little prematurely. Um, but if, I, if King G1, Black will play Rook takes F3. Joel, I have um, just Pascal uh, chiming in. I have a quick yep. question from the audience here from uh, somebody named Undisputed29. Uh, and it is a Fisher question, but it was just asked now, you know, not during a Fisher game. So I'm asking it anyway. Um, the question is, Fisher demonstrated very strong patience when playing this game. Do you think there's a particular way of training that compels players to be more patient in long games? Um, no, I, I don't, I don't think there's a way of, a way of training uh, other, other than, uh, just, uh, experience picked up by, by studying and, and, and being, being exposed to the way that other, other players play. Uh, the thing about patience is that obviously it's something that you can learn. And one thing, one thing that I'm trying to teach here is, is this bit of patience especially uh, connected to the exchange sacrifice because I think that the problem that a lot of people have is that they, when, when they look at exchange sacrifice, they feel like something has to happen right away. But, you know, Fisher, it just had that very natural, clean, crisp style. Um, you know, someone like Magnus, you know, I think Magnus tends to be compared more to Karpov, but I also see some, some similarities in the, in the way that, uh, the, the way that, uh, that Fisher played, you know, like we look at, uh, uh, Carlson and he, he just knows where the pieces go. And it's kind of like that, you know, Fisher knew where to put the pieces. It wasn't really about, you know, about being a uh, incredible calculator or, uh, yeah, sometimes but the, it, it, it feels like with both uh, Carlson and Fisher, you, you see their games and it feels, when you're walking, when you're going through the moves, it seems easier than it really is. Like you're like, oh, you know, okay, like maybe I could have done that, and it's not not actually. Of course, the reality is not like that. But. Yeah, I mean, for the for the for the instructor, which I often am, I love Fisher's games because he just he he very often demonstrates uh, you know understanding of important concepts, but you know. Um, without the, the crazy variations, like those guys are very very different from Kasparov whose games were just totally full of complications, you know, very, very different kinds of player. Of course, uh, a, a very great player in his own right, just in a different style. But that patience, you know, patience comes from experience and, and, and gaining strength and just, um, just appreciating um, that the advantage you have is that it, is it a short-term advantage or a long-term advantage? When it's a short-term advantage, you know, like oh, you know, my, you know, I have a better development. My opponent's going to develop pieces in a couple of moves, or I have this nice build-up. My, my opponent's going to make a couple defensive moves, and he's going to be okay. That's not necessarily the time for patience. But when you have a long-term advantage, so one thing you can do is, is you, if you appreciate that you have a long-term advantage, then a lot of times the prosecution of that advantage is really not to mess anything up is not to give your opponent any counter chances, just to keep your position clean and just to steadily move towards, uh, towards victory, you know, with, with without, uh, without complications. So that, that's, that's part of it is to, is to recognize the nature of, of advantage that, that, that you have, but a very, very good question there. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. All right. So I, uh, so I get back to this game, King G1, Rook F3, and that's, 
that's collapsed because the rook on d2 is hanging to a, to a fork. Okay, so he thought about uh, king e1, but then uh, then then the the, the other um, sacrifice happens, and uh, black could play rook f1 and c3 check. Um, just to go a little further, this is a good continuation. Rook f2, knight takes f2, rook takes rook on c1, the white position collapses. So. So he he, so he can't remove the king. Knight takes f3, looks like a threat. Now, the engine, okay, the engines always spoil this thing. Um, Marin wrote the book in 2003, and maybe the engines weren't that useful then, and this game was played well before that. Uh, apparently, white can play rook e1, guards everything. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, Black doesn't have something. Maybe I don't know. It sort of looks like Black could could try c3 and knight takes f3, but for some reason <laughs> the computer, I guess, finds finds a, finds a way out that uh, uh, you know that Marin maybe wasn't so so sure about. But um, but uh, what he did is he made a very practical decision. He says, "Okay, I have to stabilize my position. You know, I have to prevent you know my opponent from crashing through." So he played a real surprise move, bishop d1, you know, which at first looks like a kind of blunder. But, okay, he stabilizes that king's. So black comes in, takes the exchange. Why not? But now that knight's gone, that relieves some of the pressure. Bishop e3 attacks, and then he attacks his pawn on g5. The engine is less kind to White's position than, than Marin was in his analysis. And, you know, sometimes we have to kind of separate out the computer reality from the practical reality, that it's not always so easy to find the best moves. But uh, Black definitely should have utilized his deep pawn while he had the chance. He can go deep two. And then, uh, you know, Marin thought that this position was, was uh, complicated, uh, you know, compensation. But the rook d7 is, e even this is strong for black. Rook c7, I think, maybe is even stronger. Um, the engine finds this to be a winning position for black. But I, I don't think that it's so obvious, you know, from a human standpoint. Um, nonetheless, it's certainly uh, the, the continuation that black should have gone for to, to, to um you know, use his activity, but basically Kanak just kept trying to consolidate this position, King e1, and even here he should play d2 and give a check, I guess this one, and then the rook can penetrate and uh, and black gets, gets a lot of play with, the, with, with his extra exchange. But King g7, uh, I think white, once white gets here, I, I feel like Practically speaking, uh, it's 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 a pretty tight game. Uh, like I said, the engine engine takes a long time before it likes White's position, but uh, but Black can never really kind of get around to to an effective plan. And uh, that Bishop D7 definitely was uh, was a mistake. Um, and now finally, you have to say that White is just better because he's he's gonna he's gonna collect another pawn. And, um, you know, the D pawn is ready to round up, but he actually takes off the A pawn. And really, it's, it's actually kind of a mop-up job after this because black has too many weaknesses and not enough play. And Marin decided to use full power of the F pawn. What's interesting about it is, is it looks, certainly looked like Black's position was close to collapse, that, uh, that Marin actually wins this by kind of minimal means, h5. Okay, and he, he goes to, to, to trade those pawns off. Rook g5 check is a nice move because Black, um, Black had to move the king to the h file because uh, otherwise Rook f5 and trade rooks and then an a4 and you make a queen yeah so um so he had to he had to move the king farther away 
she certainly didn't want to do. Prevents rook c2. And okay, so now he goes rook b5. So he's got the king cut off. So the, the, the only kind of defense in this type of situation when your king is cut off is to use your rook to, to check and attack the pawn, but because the white rook can block that check on the C file, the B pawn can just run right through. Black king has no way of getting back. So very routine win, you know, text, textbook uh, rook and pawn ending stuff. So it's so a win for Marin. Okay, so, well, you can argue that uh, that exchange sacrifice wasn't technically sound, but sometimes uh, in a tough situation, uh, an exchange sacrifice can can be the thing to do to improve your chances, to give you practical chances, to try to turn things around and get and get the initiative, take away your opponent's initiative and turn things around. And uh, Marin was uh, was able to do that there. I thought that's a very interesting example. Uh, the next position, this is a really fun one, and this was from a blitz tournament. Um, I, I think it's it's great that Marin got this game. I mean, maybe he was present there uh, because uh, you, you don't necessarily expect uh, blitz tournaments from the '90s to get uh, blitz games from the '90s get circulated. This is a position game between uh, the Grandmasters of Pichon and Svitan, and okay. You'd have to guess it was a king's Indian. And black is heavily loaded up for the king's side attack. White is absolutely destroying the the, uh, the queen's side. But he has to avoid being baited, of course. Otherwise, he loses the game. Well, in the game, Apishan didn't see the threat. He played rookie one. And now black has a gorgeous checkmate. Boom. All right, you got to take that because king h1, g2. And now the knights roll in and the knights deliver the mate. That's one of the most beautiful checkmates I've ever seen. That's pretty darn cool. But of course, we haven't gotten to the exchange sacrifice yet, right? Okay, so rook e1, of course, is the, is, is the wrong move, right? Well, in this position, white can take the bishop. And that's what he needs to do. Well, why did he do it? Probably thought, well, queen takes h3. My goose is cooked, g2. Mate is coming. What can I do? Well, there is only one thing white can do about it, but it's actually pretty strong. He can play rook f2. You know, hey, you could put a rook on prees to a pawn because he just took a piece. And black takes, white takes back. Actually, white is really in business now because, um, well, you have to answer over here. And if uh, takes on c7, now white actually, sorry, take on b6, white actually has a kind of a cool tactic, knight c7, and then attack the queen. Where does the queen go? Well... The only squares I see are d7 and c8, and in both cases, white can play knight b6 and fork the queen and the rook on a8, and uh, that gives white a very good position. So what's kind of interesting, uh, if we go back here, um, how do I go back? Okay, let's go back from here. All right, so takes, queen takes, all right? So, um, uh, <laughs> I'm not really sure how to go back in the variations, all right? I'm just getting, getting used to this. <laughs> all right, I'll try to do better this time. All right, so... Pawn takes. Now what black should do is he should take on b6. Doesn't it have to be a hurry to take here? It actually just allows white to clean up the, the king side with rook f2. Okay? 
and um, you know white can take and then black can take trade the rooks and take on b6 and this position the engine assesses as about equal because yeah okay white is over on the queen side he's got to pass deep on but now black can you know play knight g5 and start attacking the king side and uh, you know still maintains chances over there so uh, that would have still been a very tense game but uh but that rook f2 it, it's like uh, uh it, it's not necessarily um an, an intuitive uh, move rook f2 because you're just putting a rook on prees to a pawn you know this is sort of a natural aversion at least i think for um experienced players to do something like that but it would have saved a position in this game all right now for a classic uh, this is a classic position game Ruszewski against petrosian Now, Sammy has a pretty good uh, buildup in the center going. He's got the bishop pair. And it's not clear that he has an actual threat yet, but he's sort of loading up to do something. Uh, maybe the threat is to play bishop f3 and then d5. Yeah? So black has to kind of get a handle on on the center he needs some some measure of blockade now okay like i said the engines they, they always they, they they love to be party poopers uh the the engine according to the engine uh tigran's move is second best it says that black should play rook a7 okay but this sort of releases control of, of the middle it allows white to play e6 it turns out on e6 Black can play uh, f6, and and the the roof somehow doesn't cave in. I mean, it looks very risky from a human point of view. A computer says black could do it. Uh, so this again, this is where the the, the practical considerations uh, come in, because rook a7 just looks like you're sort of just leaving it to your opponent to to, to throw punches. But the move Petrosian played, rook e6. So now he starts to to affect a blockade in the middle. Uh, okay, of, of course white can take it, but uh, this speaks to a point I made yesterday that when sacrificing exchange, generally exchange sacrifices more effective if you can get your one of your opponent's strong minor pieces. And the, the white square bishop obviously is much stronger than the dark square bishop, which is, you know, hemmed in by all of these pawns, right? So, um, uh, so, so black is kind of happy to get to get that off the board. Um, now it's hard to say what white should should do here. Um, he Ruszewski went for a four. He decided that he wanted to try to break up these pawns because black really needs to be able to advance uh, to answer this with b4 to keep a you know a dynamic pawn advance going on that side of the board but if he plays b4 white can play d5 then he can take the rook and uh take this pawn on c4 so that's kind of a constant theme in these couple of moves is that he wants to try to to uh take that pawn on c4 so Petrosian went directly 97. Yeah. All right, so he takes the rook. And he plays queen f1. All right, he's trying to stay on this pawn on c4 to prevent b4. If he played something like queen f2, then black could get this move in b4. If black got that far, then white could, could get into trouble. Black has a beautiful blockade. Um, I talked about weak squares yesterday. Uh, obviously, you know, weak squares and blockade are, are two things that kind of, you know, go hand in hand. Uh, the engine suggests that White missed an opportunity. He should have played rook to, to f3 uh, with a couple of possibilities, knight d5, then the queen comes to c1. So let's take some vision. You need to, to move the rook to open that square up. And now of b4, 
um, white is able to take and hit this pawn on c4. And the other possibility is that black tries to play b4 first, then white has a strong move in d5. Um, if, uh, if knight takes, you can take the pawn on c4, and if pawn takes, e6 is apparently giving white a, a strong kingside attack. Okay, so Ryshevsky played queen f1, and now bishop d3, and this kind of levels out the game because uh, uh, white needs to, to get that queen side under control, so he, we have the sack back, and white, you know, comes out with an extra pawn, uh, but um, with black having a good knight and a blockade, doesn't really get much from it. Um, he could he could have tried c4 here, knight b6. Um, that's one possible variation. Um, white could also try to play. Um, D5 here, but okay, the position is, uh, is 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 kind of unclear. Like something like takes uh, C5, Bishop D4, and now Queen E6 or Queen G6 are okay moves here. It's very it's complicated, but maybe balanced. So Roshevsky played more solidly. I have to assume that Roshevsky didn't have any time. He was always a terrible time pressure addict. But now the position kind of balances out because White's extra pawn is really not that meaningful with Black having this wonderful blockade. And what ultimately happens is the, uh, the A pawn and B pawn get traded. Bishop e1, and then the game suddenly ends. Why? Why does the game suddenly end? Well, it's it's move 41, and back in the dinosaur era, <laughs> when they got to pass move 40, they would adjourn the game. They put the move in an envelope. Those just you know younger viewers out there. So they did write down the move, put their score sheet in an envelope, and seal it up. It's called adjourning the game. You know. People who are old like me, you know, remember it. I actually used to adjourn games. It seemed like a normal thing to do. So you often see games that end right after the point where they would have adjourned because, you know, they had time to look at it and they decided that, yeah, this is really nothing to do. It's just, it's just going to be a draw. White can't make any progress with an extra pawn because he's totally blocked in the middle of the board. So that great defensive sacrifice you know, kind of stopped White's initiative from uh, from getting out of hand. It's the rookie six, a very cool move by by uh, Tigran uh, Petrosian. All right, so next I'm going to move into kind of a whole different realm. A couple of uh, games from modern players. Uh, Gary Kasparov. Um, this game. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to witness it in person. It was played in the Horgan tournament 1994, which I got to play in. Uh, it was the year that I got to play the uh, elite level tournaments. I had, you know, had my, my big rating. I was uh, 2620. And you say like 2620. It's like, yeah, but 2620 was like, was like top 40 in the world. In, in 1994, so um, so I got invited to some very big tournaments uh, uh, that year, and the, this one Kasparov was in, and I was lucky to draw my game against Kasparov, even though it was a terrible, terrible, terrible game. I was very, very lucky, um, and it was the only game that Kasparov, the only game in the tournament that Kasparov did not win with White, and he has White in this game, and Shirov <laughs> does not survive. Um, but this is this is one of the most uh, amazing exchange sacrifices to me, and so the next class of uh, of uh, sacrifices that we look at, uh, I, I like to think of it as the Seinfeldian exchange sacrifice. Those of you who used to watch the 
that uh, that old comedy Seinfeld might remember. There was a storyline where they were pitching their lives as a as a show to NBC, and they said, "What's the show about?" The show's about nothing. So we'll see <laughs> what what I mean by that when we get to the exchange sacrifice. Of course, Shirov, a very very sharp player, fire on board. You know, we all know about that. Uh, by the way, he destroyed me in the, in our game in this tournament, and he, he put that in his book. It was a pretty cool game. So it's a Sveshnikov Sicilian. I mean, they still play the Sveshnikov today, but, um, you know, it was maybe indicative of a little different um, temperament then than it is now. All right, Bishop B7, so Shirov plays a kind of sideline that uh, really kind of um, fell by the by the wayside uh, you know eventually after this bishop b7 and knight b8 I mean normally the the idea in this in this opening for the knight to come to e7 to challenge the knight but the thinking here is knight come to d7 kind of then you, you set up kind of a, a formation like in a knight orf you know um, and uh, the knight can sometimes go to c5 at the e4 pawn. So that's that's kind of the thinking there. But of course, you know, white, as often in Sveshnikov, has the opportunity to break up the pawns with a4. OK, now black plays knight c5. Subsequently, uh, when people had this position with black, and they did for a while, before giving it up. Uh, some some other players played rook b8 here. But uh, Shira played knight c5, probably suspecting nothing. And I, I don't know if this was home analysis or not. Uh, Gary was certainly great at that. Uh, but <laughs> whatever, you know, just <laughs> whether you think of it at home or you think it over the board, just, you know, the idea to play rook takes b7. It's, 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 it's mind-bending. Takes, and then the follow-up. Boom. Okay, so what's going on here? Looks like White just gave up an exchange for nothing. He certainly didn't take any material. He doesn't have a passed pawn. He might potentially have a passed pawn. Certainly not the passed pawn, like the passed pawn we saw yesterday in the, the game of Mickey Adams. We had a he had an unassailable knight on d5, but he had a b pawn, which was almost a guaranteed queen. In this case, white doesn't even want to move the pawn to b5 because if he moves the pawn to b5, black can, is, can put the knight on c5. So what does white have? Well, white has an absolutely huge superiority in the minor pieces. All right, black has his bad bishop. This is a this is a typical problem. In the Sveshnikov, it's what you have to avoid. You know, you have to avoid a position where you're down to the dark square bishop and your opponent, let's say, has a knight on d5. So that's kind of a typical nightmare scenario for black in the Sveshnikov. And that aspect of it is, is the existing here. Black's other minor piece, knight on b7. Well, you know, Knights are not bad in positions in the same way that bishops are. Bishops are hemmed in by pawns. Knights are just in unfortunate places. And that b7 is about unfortunate as you can get because with the pawn on b4, you can't move anywhere. Well, all it could do is move back to d8 if the queen moves and then it gets in the way. Black has to play, I don't know, like four moves before that knight can challenge the white knight in d5. And meanwhile, white can start improving his other pieces. So white just has this huge advantage in the minor pieces. Is that worth an exchange? Uh, it seems to be, at least from a practical standpoint, I think the engine was trying to say that black is a tiny bit better. It really doesn't matter what the, what the engine said. Uh, it's just, this is not a fun position to play for black, and you can hardly move move anything. So let's see how it went. All right, bishop g5, the typical Sveshnikov move, prevents a knight from going to e3. If this knight goes to e3, black will snap it off instantly. 
I mean, sometimes in the Svezhnikov, the knight comes to e3 and black doesn't take it. But those are positions where black has his light square bishop on the board. And oh yeah, by the way, that was black's best minor piece. And that's the one that white got for the rook. So white now brings this knight into a great position. Okay, black plays a5. And this is approved by the computer. Um, it's trying to get some activity. Well, you have a rook. It's not a bad idea to open the file for it. This rook can be active, but the knight on b7 is still, <laughs> still going to be awful. All right. At the queen b8, uh, Gary makes a nice move here. He plays the h4. And it's like, okay, the bishop has to, has to make up its mind, you know? He has to choose one diagonal. Uh, you know, if the bishop goes back to d8, that now you're blocking this rook on f8. You are guarding b6, but uh, this rook can't go anywhere. Knight b7 can't go anywhere. I mean, none of the pieces can go anywhere. So why? we'll just play g3 and then probably castle. So black decides to go bishop h6, but now the bishop is kind of shut out from other things. This e7 square is available. In, in, in a lot of variations. So white play, attacks the rook and he castles, defending f2. So now, now knight d7 becomes a possibility to get the exchange back. All right, so he gets the queen out of the way of knight d7. And uh, uh, apparently, uh, in this position, the strongest move was bishop b5. Um, it's not really such an obvious thing, but I guess it's just that black, just hard for, for black to find uh, find a useful move as, you know, now knight d7 is, is, is threatened more strongly, but already, you know, white is getting a very good position. So knight d7, Black should have played, I think, rook a8. <laughs> okay, so white could have repeated the position, I guess. All right, so let's get back to the game here. Okay, so Shira played knight d8, giving back the exchange, offering back the exchange, and he's thinking like, I just kind of want to want to quiet the position down, and you know he can kind of taste salvation for the knight, the knight coming back to, to coming to e6 and getting to a good square, but it didn't quite work out. First he takes it, and then he pushes the pawn. Well, that's the problem. That that pawn is very strong. So he's looking for this counterplay, but white just steps out of it. The threat to take the pawn on h7 is very strong, creating a back rank mating threat. So he tries to run away. He saves the bishop. It's just some nice tactics. And oh, unfortunately, there's a knight fork. All right, so... Shirov soldiers on, tries to take advantage of the fact that knight doesn't have a good square, but, you know, Kasparov is going to get what he wants out of this rook. Rook a1, if you take the knight, rook a7, uh, check, is, uh, you get to take the knight with check, and that's that's winning, so he try, hits the rook, rook comes to a3, and that's that's a good move because black had, if, if you go rook a8, black had, uh, black had ideas of, um, check and bishop f4 check and then suddenly there's a possibility of perpetual check down here so he avoided that with rook a3 and after bishop c1 one last move to wrap things up knight e3 he gets the knight back to a strong strong and safe square threatens knight f5 check okay black could take it but then the rook takes maintaining the pawn structure White is an exchange and the pawn up, totally finished. So that is as uh, Seinfeldian 
as they get, as exchange sacrifices get. Uh, just one of my favorites of all time, uh, Rook takes B7. And, uh, you know, I, I watched it happen and I thought like, wow, what is that? All right, so I have one, one, more, one more game to show. And this is uh, a little bit similar in nature to, to, that, to the Kasparov um, sacrifice. And it was played at around the same time, but, but it's, a, it's a much deeper game, I, I feel. And uh, uh, I think there's a lot to be learned about, uh, about this, uh, the, the, the patient the patient exchange sacrifice, that's one way to look at it, you know, because in this game, Kramnik is, is, is very patient and he understands he's never panicked about being down the exchange. It never bothers him. He's just, you know, looking to make the most of his position. So this is Ivanchuk against Kramnik in uh, 1994. Of course, Kramnik is only 18 at the time. But, uh, you know, very, very strong, as was Ivanchuk at that time. So this is the Sicilian. Back in the day, Vlad played the Sicilian. Eventually became Mr. Solid with E4, E5. This was a very popular line at the time in the 90s. And even before that, I played it myself for black. This is my main opening when I appeared in my one interzonal in 1987. Uh, it's interesting. Um, okay, bishop e3, obviously a good move. Um, back then, it was uh, either uh, bishop e3 or bishop f4. Um, bishop h4 not so popular because of knight takes e4 that that's the whole idea of the, of the of the line for black but it's interesting that nowadays almost everyone takes and plays bishop f4 and maybe this line is uh, considered as even slightly dubious for black now kind of dangerous but uh, in the 90s uh, nobody did that all right so h6 bishop e3 not going to really say anything more about the uh, the theory except that when <laughs> putting your rook opposite the queen is always a good thing to do. So uh, Kramnik uh, gets the queen away. And he takes with the bishop because in this case he wants to attack the queen. All right, so here black can play queen a7. And it's okay. Position is okay for black. Kramnik sees pretty deeply into the position. Uh, not 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 necessarily deeply in terms of a lot of moves, but just really thinking about it in, in in a way that most people would not. And and he played the move knight g4, a move that could be played by a player who's very bad or very good. <laughs> it could be played by someone who's very bad because not seeing the move queen f3 which attacks the knight on g4 and the rook on a8. Okay, Kramnik is not that kind of player. But after queen f3, black is uh, forced to take the bishop. And then white takes the rook in the corner. Really pretty much has to, because if you take back the knight, black could play, say, bishop b7. White will suffer without that dark squared bishop. It's a very important piece. So white at least needs to get a rook for it. Okay, so this is where um, this is where the player who <laughs> is not a beginner has you know seen that white would play queen f three. Uh, so a moderately strong player, but not Graham, that would be would be maybe considering this with the idea of playing knight c six and hemming in the queen. So white black is kind of two moves away from winning. Castles bishop b seven. It's all over. But okay, Ivanchuk is, is a clever guy, you know, and uh, he, he's very tricky in this game, if not successful. He would he would have knight takes b5 in store. 
and black takes bishop takes b5 black is unable because of the pin black is unable to take to to uh, defend the knight on c6 so white the white queen comes out eating all right so so knight c6 is not successful this is where most human beings would reject the line because you can't trap the queen but you know Kramnik is not like everybody else he plays knight to d7 he just retreats the knight and okay the white queen is going to be in danger a couple moves but he's not threatening to trap it he is threatening to take upon an f4 but otherwise, there don't really seem to be any threats. How does this work? Well, there's a lot of factors going on. Black has the bishop pair. That bishop pair is going to be strong. And it, once again, and we see that it pops up a lot in these exchange sacrifices, especially as the long-term factor. Bishop pair is going to be very meaningful. But also, the unopposed bishop, that dark square bishop, that is going to be a major pain for white. We're going to see that he's not really going to have an answer for that piece. So um, black has, I don't know, you could almost call it a long, long short, short term compensation. What is that? What do I mean by that? Well, the thing is, we're in the opening, okay? And when you have exchange sacrifices very early on, they're very different than an end game when the, the rooks have a lot of, uh, of uh, space to move around or even in the middle games, sometimes there's a lot of good open files. Well, this is a good open file for the rook on D1, but this rook on H1 is not playing. It's a few moves away from playing. All right, the bishop on F1 has to find a way to get out before the rook on H1 can do anything. Uh, Ivanchik is actually, he's actually eventually going to mobilize his rooks, but at a, at a heavy cost. All right. So, all right, what's going on here? This, this, uh, you know, he's attacking this pawn on, on F4 and Ivanchik tries to move G3, which turns out to be not very successful, makes things worse. But you say, well, why not just queen F3? Just bring the queen back, return with, with the booty. Okay. Well, bishop b7. All right. Now, let's say white plays queen e3. This is, this is a very interesting position. And I've lectured a few times on this position before. And, you know, I point, I've always pointed out that, okay, queen e3, black can attack the pawn in f4 again. White can't play g3 because of the diagonal, right? So white has to take on d6, the sack back. And the thing is that that's probably the best that white can do in this position. And then he can follow up. But I think then he can move the bishop. I'm not sure the best square because bishop g2, rook g1. All right. And so you get a position with even material and and white can play. Maybe bishop d3 is, is better to answer b4 better. But the thing about it is I didn't really appreciate this until the, the last the time that I looked at this is that um, <laughs> if you put this on the engine, engine really likes black's position, okay? So in case you, you want to label those computers as just, you know, material grabbers, uh, they certainly aren't anymore. So black could castle. And it's, it's really kind of hard to pin down an analysis of the position, but I'm just, I'm just going to give one possible variation. I mean, there are actually sort of many ideas that, that, that Black has here. So Bishop D3, let's just follow one line. This is one computer line. Basically, this is another line black is just playing down exchange doesn't care. Well, now there's a big threat of knight a4. <laughs> you can't preempt uh, knight a4 with b3 because that, that's uh, 
that's the old uh, cure being worse than the disease, right? Yeah. Now, when you get deep into computer analysis, it starts finding that G4 is the only possibility to get counterplay, and then knight a4, g5, maybe white is in time to make something happen. But I, I think it's just very interesting to see that black doesn't have to worry at all about being down the exchange. It's quite possible just to, to play this, just to, to play just sort of casual, normal moves, improve your position, and play down the exchange. You know, black doesn't even have to win win it back with bishop d6. So I, I think that's really kind of kind of extraordinary. But just the same, just the same. It seems that um, that queen uh, queen f f3 was the best move. Uh, Ivanchuk played g3. This is a very tricky move. Um, now, black has to has to hurry here because if he castles, then white will play bishop g2, and that will prevent the bishop from getting the long tag. And now white's doing well. But there's a strong move, knight b6. And that forces the queen back in the diagonal, and, well, white just opened that diagonal. So now when the, the, uh, the bishop comes to b7, we've got a skewer. Okay, now Ivanchuk is a smart guy. He saw this. Plays ninety four. Now, what's really I think kind of uh, kind of crazy about this position is that uh, again I was just looking at it recently uh, on the computer, and uh, the computer says, "Okay, Black can actually castle in this position." And I thought, "Well, okay, castle slows Bishop G two." So, so, so now I've f five. This knight f six check, and the bishop is hanging. But again, black can black can kind of play like <laughs> like no big deal. Rook c eight, attack the pawn, and just say, okay, I'm just going to position for this attack on the queen side. Maybe take the knight and e four and play bishop f six, and this is pretty dangerous. This is pretty dangerous. Black could just play an exchange now. But uh, but just has wonderful pieces, and you say okay, white has has an exchange, but okay, what impact does this rook on h1 have right now? Okay, white might get into big trouble before that rook on h1 can even move. So that's 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 a very I thought a very interesting point in this position. I only just recently noticed that, but. But uh, cram next move f5, it's uh, just concretely very strong. Um, and Ivanchuk's idea was to check and play knight f2. Now, I think coming up next is the best move of the game, right? Because black has some very attractive moves. First of all, the the obvious thing to do is to take the rook. And I, I, I tell you, the, 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 the typical amateur player would say, okay, yeah, let me take the rook and the knight in the corner and then figure out what to do. <laughs> I call it uh, take first, ask questions later. It's not really a good strategy for chess. Okay. Let's look at what else black can do in this position. Okay, some tactics. Bishop c5, hitting this knight in f2. Removing the defender, right? You can, you can def you defend the knight, black takes, takes the rook. Ivanchuk had something planned. Knight h3. You take the rook, knight g5. Mm -hmm. Now some big counter threats. Knight takes e6 is one of them. Also rook d8 check to deflect the queen away from the defense of the maid on f7. Uh, so for instance, queen, queen e7 fails. Rook d8 mates. Bishop d5, also fail. Rook takes d5, setting up a fork. Okay, so after knight g5, black has to take it. White takes, king f7, queen h5. Uh, 
Uh, black has to black has to play king f8. If he goes king g8, queen e8, and the e6 pawn drops, it's uh, not worth it for black. So king f8, queen h8. So this line ends in a draw by perpetual check. Okay? So that's what Ivancha could work out, that he can he can hold, he can hold a draw on bishop c5. Okay? So what does Kramnik do? Again, he doesn't carry his down exchange. He's not worried about that. He plays bishop f6. He just calmly moves that bishop into strong position. And now I, oh, look over there. A, a king's position with nothing defending, no defenders over there. A bishop hitting b2, a knight ready to come to a4. I mean, it's almost collapse. And you say, well, yeah, but why don't I just take this rook and then go there? So now I'm not down in exchange anymore. Yeah, okay, then you can feel you can feel comfy that you're not down in exchange anymore. But now this knight can chug over to d3 and defend. And white, white's life got easier. Yeah. So that's why you don't take the rook. So Kramnik just played bishop f6. That's what I love about this was this such patience. You know, he doesn't, he, you know, he's looking at bishop c5, but it doesn't work. He says, well, okay, then do I need to take the rook? No, I don't need to take the rook. I'm threatening that rook, right? It's fine. So bishop d3 he plays. Well, the thing is, if white, you say, well, didn't we give white the chance to play rook g1? Well, okay. Knight a4. Bishop b4 removing the defender. So now black is going to take the knight and take on b2, the huge gash in the king's side. The knight can't move because it's made on c2. And there's no way to kind of, you know, try to defend defend uh, b2 by waiting for a capture and taking the c-pawn because you can't bring a piece to the second rank and get your king to b1. You only get one move. So this is pretty ruinous. So, okay, so bishop f6 is pretty strong. Now credit Ivanchuk, he does the best he can with it. He realizes that uh, desperate times call for desperate measures. So he says, okay, I've got to activate quickly. Plays bishop d3, knight a4, and rook e1. He says, yeah. My rooks got to be rooks. They got to get in the game. They got to get to those open files and do stuff and, and get a counterattack going. That's 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 all he can do. Bishop b2, king b1. Of course, black is not very far from checkmate. And he plays bishop d5. So he's re he's really kind of circling in on that on that uh, that king, you know, in a couple of moves. Uh, you know, if Black gets gets a free move, he can bring his queen in, and then he's, you know, threatening bishop bishop a two and and all kinds of mates. So White has to act quickly. So he does with uh, with bishop takes the bishop takes b five. All right, so it's not so much that he takes a pawn. Uh, he attacks the knight, which is very useful. He also attacks the bishop. Like if black takes the bishop, white can take on d5. Because if pawn takes, is a mate on, on e8. All right? All right, so Kramnik says, all right, so you want my bishop. But you're going to take my bishop. Maybe you get a little something, something for it. So he takes on a2. And now it takes. He doesn't actually lose time doing this because by bringing the king to a2, he threatens queen c4. It's a very important point. Um, if rook takes e6, queen c4 check, king b1. Okay, if you take the rook, there's rook d8 check, yeah? But he actually has the mate here. Knight c3, check. Now king a1, queen a3 is sort of prosaic, but that's a nice checkmate. You don't really see that pattern all that often. And that's very important. You know, sometimes 
you can stamp out your counter your opponent's counterplay by threatening to mate with checks. So what could white do? Well, he's got to get his king out of the way. King b1 is really the only thing he can try. Now queen c4 is different because that allows uh, white to play a rook d8 check and take the rook in the corner. The difference now is that the king has d1 square. So the, the white doesn't, black doesn't have the same mate. Okay, so after king b1, black shifts gears a little bit and plays queen a5. He's still got the same mate threat, but now he, the queen is covering the d8 square, so rook d8 is not possible. So again, black is not able to really get counterplay. White is not able to get counterplay. So he tries knight d3. Okay, so he covers the b4 square. The bishop comes to a3. All right, once again, there's a threat of mate with checks. Knight c3, king a1, and bishop c1. So white has to defend it. Well, there's not a lot of options. Anybody, you know, see? What, how can white defend that? Well, it's not like king a2. So basically, he's been reduced to all these defensive moves of just, just moving his king to, to, to sort of sidestep in the mating patterns. But uh, Kramnik still rounds him up. First he checks, and then he just puts the knight on d5. So he's just kind of, uh, you know, getting everything rounded up to come back. Queen, threatening queen a4 check, and then knight c3 with the same mating pattern. And <laughs> it's kind of humorous. What can white do about it? King a2, it's, it's about the best he could come up with. Okay, if knight c3 comes back, king b3. But now, okay, Kramnik sets up a different pattern. He goes bishop b4. King has to go to b1, and now bishop c3. That's that threat of mate on a1. Uh, if he goes knight b2, black and black queen b4, and you have no way of defending that. So forced mate. That's one of my favorite games. I think probably my favorite Kramnik game. Uh, I, I just love it because, um, you know, I, I look at other grandmasters play and they play games, say, that's a nice game. And sometimes I say like, okay, I could have done that. <laughs> this is, this is not a game that like everyone could say, yeah, I could have done that. <clears throat> this is, this is really profound stuff. This is really profound stuff. So this is, <clears throat> if, you know, if we start out with, uh, exchange sacrifice 101, this is like exchange sacrifice 590, you know? This is really, you know, high level stuff. So, um, yeah, that was, that was just, just uh, an amazing game. And so we kind of started off yesterday with what I called no brainers, you know, like exchange sacrifices that, you know, probably a lot of players, not just grandmasters say like, yeah, I get that. Yeah, that's, that, that, that I can see that's going to work. This one, this one was really very high level stuff. So this is, this is kind of the, the pinnacle of exchange sacking. So anyway, so that, that will con conclude the, um, uh, the lesson for today, the, uh, uh, the uh, stay at home workshop. Uh, I, I want to uh, remind every, everyone um, that uh, Chess 24 currently has a special uh, for you that if you are not yet a premium member and you want to step up uh, to premium membership with the code CANDIDATES2020, you can get 40% off premium membership. And it's, uh, it's a good deal. It's really good to be a premium member, member and then you you can uh, download games and you can uh, you can make comments and you can you know you can bug everybody <laughs> if somebody makes an annoying comment you get to answer back it's pretty cool so um, yeah that'll do for today uh, I will be back again uh, tomorrow uh, same time as well as uh, Friday and uh, tomorrow I've got a uh, I think a really cool uh, end game lesson uh, prepared for you, for you guys, and now I did write a book on Endgame, so I got a lot to say about it, uh, and I think I think that uh, should be fun. 
So I uh, just uh, want to thank all the viewers today, uh, everyone who, uh, uh, you know, sharing their uh, social isolation with me in these, uh, in these difficult times. Uh, and uh, hope I see you uh, guys again tomorrow. Thanks a lot, Joel.